Hi there. I'm Dean Walker, founder of Living Resilience Deep Academy, a series of resources and support offerings for the Collapse Aware community around the world. And this particular um, video excerpt is from a conference from the Embodiment podcast and uh, the Embodiment conference, which is now uh, has been done for the past couple of years. I think it's a really great, um, great piece of work. <clears throat> Man from uh, the UK, uh, whom you'll see for a minute or so, as he does a bit of a commercial for one of his content providers of this uh, embodiment work of uh, a particular kind. And, you know, really all the providers in the conference uh, have something to do with personal growth of some kind or another. And um, this particular presenter that is not in the commercial, the commercial is for the beginning, before the uh, person who's speaking in this video gets going. Uh, the person in the commercial, I think is doing great work. I've checked out their stuff. I can't wait to participate. I think it's, uh, you know, there's a remarkable amount of strong, very strong uh, offerings coming from the embodiment conference every year. So you'll see that. And the person who's uh, doing this particular hour long presentation after the commercial, if you will, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, a man named Clinton uh, Callahan. Clinton has uh, created a body of work since the mid 70s called possibility management. And uh, it's a loosely knit a group of trainers around the world, people who have just decided, yeah, they really like this work. And so they uh, have taken it to their own countries, Australia, a lot of them in the States, mostly in Europe. And um, I'm including this particular video because I include a, an emphasis on particular aspects of possibility management and Clinton's work and, and the other trainers. Because I, th I think it's extraordinarily valuable for people in the Collapse Aware community who are trying to find their center, who are trying to find a sense of being able to return to a sense of uh, authentic um, ownership of who they are, a sense of being grounded and inhabiting their body and inhabiting their identity, uh, inhabiting the mystery that life actually is when they crack open and decide, you know, I don't want to be a part of this business as usual culture anymore, but how the heck do you create something new? You know, there's just this uh, magical thinking is about all we've got in this fossil fuel driven business as usual culture. And <clears throat> there really is no way to crack outside of that business as usual structure to really see new possibility. Um, that you'll, you'll hear him, you'll hear Clinton describe his own engagement with that and the, and the engagement of the work with that. I just wanna mention a couple of quotes that I'm sure you've heard, uh, I'm hoping I'll say them right. Uh, one's from Charles Eisenstein, where he suggests that we uh, all can imagine the, um, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. And uh, while I definitely have heard him say that a lot, I've heard him put it into context a lot, um, what I hear an awful lot of the time is kind of a magical thinking, you know, when it comes down to, so how do you get from this encasement in the business as usual mindset, which we're all saturated in from birth, how do you crack out of that into something truly new? So that's one of the quotes. And one of the, re you can, if you could just carry that with you because you listen to what Clinton has to say in his talk. And then uh, there's another one, which is um, attributed to, uh, to Einstein. And basically it's, it goes something like uh, we, cannot uh, solve the problems that we are encountering today if we use the same level of thinking that was used to create them. 
and um, I couldn't agree more. So how do we create a new way of thinking? And if I may take some poetic license, I'd like to add that a new way of being, a new way of relating, a new way of reconnecting with the uh, world around us, with our own deeper self and with other people. Uh, we need new ways of relating, new ways of being, new ways of doing, and new ways of thinking. And what I'd like to just say a little bit about before I get you going on this video is two things. One, one is I'm a little shy about just letting you just go straight into the conversation because I know that uh, Clinton has the tendency to just make up words in order to serve his purposes because, and I can agree with this completely, there is almost no language for what we're encountering, what we're facing in these times of collapse and predicament. We, uh, we literally don't have a language for how to be, in, be present in this situation. And by the way, they, you know, it takes me to the really the core reason why I've, I've put together this body of work, which is to expand our capacity to be present in the face of larger and larger stressors in life. It's as simple as that, and, and it's really quite a uh, now quite a deep body of work and quite a simple motivation is to have us have the opportunity to expand our capacity to be present in the face of larger and larger stressors. And so uh, the last thing I would say is, well, let, let me finish the, the comment that I was making about Clinton and the words he makes up. Um, you know, I, it's some of them are just a little bit foreign to me and I've never really gotten comfortable with them. It's okay. You know, that's, it's not like some uh, language you must adopt in order to hear the rest of his talk. I think there's an awful lot of this talk that is really worth hearing. You start to get some of the cornerstones of their work um, and they're, they're seeing um, a, as great a need as, as I particularly see, I see in my body of work is that one of the biggest costs of the business as usual paradigm is that we've either forfeited or have had taken from us our center. And it's, um, that's a huge cost with, it's just uh, extraordinary to start to articulate, to list, to inventory the costs of having forfeited our center. Um, that's it for another day. You'll be able to hear some of his inventorying of it in this talk. We'll go over that at length. And this is a big part of the community of practice that we have as an ongoing support group in this kind of work. Because uh, it, it turns out to be of immense value to start to take on practices of reconnection. If what got us into this global predicament is our disconnection from deeper self, from other people, from earth, and even from soul, then, and we're in a predicament on top of it, um, what's a person supposed to do to be able to be functional in this world? And the only way I was been able to answer that uh, for myself in, the, in writing the book, The Impossible Conversation and creating all this work is that we each need to find our own emphasis in terms of practices of reconnecting with deeper self, other people, earth and soul. So that's why I, I'm offering this video, this presentation from Clinton Callahan and Possibility Management is I think they do a tremendous job of helping us to reconnect with a couple of, particularly a couple of cornerstone aspects of center. Imagine it's like a multifaceted center, a number of different facets to it. They really have some strength in a couple of those facets. So I think it's really worthwhile if you can put up with a little bit of interesting jargon. Um, my sense is it will be very valuable, valuable for you and um, I promise to be putting out some more videos soon about how to really put this stuff into action and make it just a little bit more clear and consistent in terms of language used and all that. So thanks for listening to this brief intro. I hope you enjoy 
Quentin Callahan's presentation about uh, the multiple facets of reclaiming our center. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in the next uh, in the next video, next round. It's at 12 o'clock in the UK time. Welcome to Embodiment Conference 2020. I would like to introduce Clinton Callahan. We will have session about presence and possibility, which is like an inner maps for unleashing new dimensions of ecstatic potential. Before we start, we're going to put one minute video of main sponsor of the channel coaching and therapy. Welcome to the coaching and therapy channel. So this channel is quite close to my heart because I train coaches and embodiment. I mean, why? Because if you don't work with the body, you're missing a lot. Whether you're a coach, a therapist, facilitator, whatever, that's how you go deep quickly. That's how you do stuff that's sticky. We have to take the body into account. This channel is sponsored by Dylan Newcomb and Uzazu Embodied Intelligence. Dylan is a genius, quite simply put, and I wouldn't say that about many people in this field. I've been studying with Dylan for, God, the first time was probably 10 years ago in the Netherlands. He speaks fluent Dutch, by the way, as well as Korean and a few other languages. What I love about Dylan is his ability to make models of things, looking at how embodiment works. His system, Uzazu, U-Z-A-Z-U, -Z -Z uh, is really all about state shifting. So I think of him as the sort of master of state changing, how we can shift our state, our client state, and how we can develop ourselves through those different um, ways of being. So I think for coaches and therapists, it's like easy to learn, practical toolkit. I've used it myself over the years. So if you want a three-day online training with Dylan, then look at the link below, or you can go to uzazu, U-Z-A-Z-U.org. And even easier, he's got an embodied assessment there you can do as well. We all love doing these little tests about ourselves, but this is an embodied one. So there you go. Welcome to the Coaching and Therapy channel. I'm going to be on this one a lot just because there's lots of cool people on here. Lots of people, I think, you know, well worth a listen. Uh, embodiment in the in facilitation is so necessary. So from me to you, welcome. And I would like to just really uh, welcome Clinton Callahan here, who is leading pioneer in five body embodiment presence. He's an author of Conscious Feelings, originator of possibility management and memetic engineer. And I believe this session will be about possibility and staying in the presence. And I would like to really hand out to Clinton. He will lead you through this presence and possibility. Welcome, Clinton. Thank you, Monica. Hello, everybody. I'm quite honored to have the opportunity to speak with you from various parts of the world. And I, I'm going to make an assumption in who you are, even though we mostly don't know each other. I assume that you're mostly interested in this channel and this information because somehow you are delivering coaching and facilitation and possibly even transformation in the work that you do with people in the world. And so as I go along, I've asked Monica to keep track of the question and answer window so that while we're going along, if you have a question that you can please ask the question, I would like to speak more directly to what you, your need is to know further about because the context that I'm using in my life and in my work is called possibility management and it is so rich and so full of surprises it has we have not yet found the, the limits of the of the context yet so we just got out of three five-day trainings here in Portugal and we didn't even begin to hit the edges of everything there is to discover so please ask the questions that come to you because if you have a question, certainly somebody else will have the same question. So, and also I just want to repeat again, it would be wonderful to have a few more people in the, on the home room window here, the panel, so that while we're going through the process, I can, I can keep my eye on you. And so you can ask questions about the procedure for you. I'll be using some words that you'll be able to understand, but not actually 
um, grasp the meaning of immediately. So if that's confusing also, please don't hesitate at all to ask further about that. For example, the word possibility. We relate to, or I relate to possibility as a bright principle. And what a bright principle means is that in the, in the entire universal wide field of consciousness, if you took that and split it up into component parts, like through a prism, the, the various light spectrum pieces that would come out of consciousness at large, or you can call it archetypal love, these, these facets are each one a bright principle. So possibility is one of those bright principles. And it turns out to be one of the most valuable bright principles in the material world. The reason being that the, we use objects a lot in, in our life. So for example, I have here just a, a little watch that I hang on my, on my belt. And the thing is made of metal and it has a little clock and it goes around and it keeps accurate time. But the thing is, the reason I, I, I value this is the possibility that it gives me. And it gives me the possibility of taking responsibility for, for time. It tells, and that's, it isn't the thing itself that I'm, I'm valuing here. It's what it does for me, the possibility that it gives me. So I'm, I'm wearing a white shirt. So why am I, you know, it's not, the, this is not such a cool shirt. It's not so incredible. What's incredible is that keeps me warm, look, makes me look professional. It has these possibilities that it provides to me. So as we go through our, our day and night through our lives, both personal and professional, we, we encounter situations in which uh, the situation is limited by the number of possibilities that we have. So what if we don't have a possibility, we cannot choose it. You can't choose a possibility that you don't have access to. And so somebody such as myself and probably you also, I call you a possibilitator. That's somebody who can manage possibility. And what you're doing is when there's not enough possibilities available in the space, what you can create more, more options to choose from for yourself, for your client, for your team, for your project. So even in your relationship, sometimes more often lately than you might think, we have too many options to choose from, too much possibility. And in this case, you have a different job as a possibilitator. And that job is to kill possibility. Now, this is a sad thing to do because if you make a choice for a certain possibility, you're simultaneously you're making a choice against other possibilities. And in that moment, you bring up another, another consideration, which is your feelings and emotions. Because to let go of a possibility involves grieving the loss of the possibility. Therefore, if it's not okay for you to be sad because you think sad is one of the bad feelings or negative feelings, then you will hesitate to choose and commit to a possibility because you're choosing against all these other possibilities. It's like cleaning out your garage. You know, you're going through the things that you have or in your attic and, some, and, and you have to make this decision. Do I keep this or do I get rid of this? And if you decide to get rid of a thing, then you will need to grieve it's the loss of it in your life. So, and if it's not okay for you to be sad, then you'll accumulate a lot of extra stuff in your attic, in your closets, in your garage. So there's some really clear signs of when it's not okay for you to feel sad. So all of a sudden we've entered, we've, we've started off with trying to be able to create and manage and destroy possibility as, as a profession, as a service to humanity, a service to your village. And we've entered a new territory called feelings and emotions. When we, okay, when we're doing this, we're, we're, I want to bring in a new word called thoughtware. Thoughtware is what we use to think with. 
in, in school, what we learn is what to think about. We get facts and information and theories and history and all these things to think about. But before you went to school, you had to already be able to think. So, or they would not let you in school. So, so you're thinking with thought where what you think with is not addressed at school at all. We don't have a class in what you think with. We have classes in what to think about. So then where did you get your thought where? You got it like everybody else from your parents. And they went to school probably. And where did they get their thought where? Well, it was before school. So your parents got their thought where from their parents. And so this thought where that we're using to think with has been handed down from generation to generation for thousands of years you are using very old thoughtware. So if you think about how often you upgrade the program in your phone, for example, well, it could be once a week, could be at least once a month they're upgrading the program in your phone. How often do you upgrade the thoughtware in your mind? Well, not yet, not very often yet. The thing is, when you upgrade your thoughtware in your mind, the structure, the construct within which you have been thinking has to take a new shape. Or if it doesn't take a new shape, you keep thinking the same way. So when you add a distinction, when you add a piece of thoughtware, you, you, it comes in and reorders the construct within which you relate to the world. And so that thing is called a liquid state, the, the state between this design and this design. In between is a, a liquid state where things are moving around inside of you. This is a strange feeling. I mean, your phone goes through it once a week and it reboots. Well, we're talking about rebooting you when you add in new thoughtware. And today I'd, I'd like to give you a chance to have that experience while we're, we're going to move into a clarified environment where you'll be able to have that experience if you want to. So let's think about what we, we just sort of brought up feelings and emotions that if you're going to provide new possibility to your client, to your, to your project, to your team, they, for them to get new thoughtware, new possibility, they'll have to upgrade their thoughtware. For them to upgrade their thought where they'll have to go through this liquid state of becoming something new. So that's the difference between a class and a workshop. If you go to a class, you get ideas and information about stuff that's already known. And, and in a training, we call it a training, you, you go through a process where you upgrade your thoughtware and, uh, and are more able to encounter the unknown. So you're bringing in, you're upgrading the structure that you're thinking with. So if you're to do this with feelings, for example, the old thoughtware about feelings is that there are three bad or negative feelings and one good feeling. So typically the three bad or negative feelings are anger, sadness, and fear, especially fear. And the only good feeling would be joy. And so it's, it's pretty clear to us that when, when um, if you experience anger, you, you'll be loud and un, uncivilized and you could hurt something or break something. It's dangerous. People get scared of you. It's, if you. If you express sadness, people think, oh God, you're spoiling the party. You're just... You're, you look bad, your makeup runs, you know, it's contagious. Other people start feeling their sadness and the whole mood changes. So clearly sadness is not a good feeling. And what about, uh, what about fear? Whoa, fear. If, if you have fear, you turn into a weakling, a chicken. Uh, um, uh, uh, it's childish, it's unrealistic. It's, it gives you, um, you lose your credibility. A leader should feel no fear. An Indian feels no fear. So these, these, these pieces of thoughtware about how we relate to our own experience of feelings and emotions is determined by our thoughtware 
And if we're using the old thought where, like we said, it's not okay to encounter new possibility or to upgrade your thoughtware. So the, the thing is that the thoughtware that we are using today in modern culture around the world is exterminating life on planet Earth at the fastest possible rate. It is not a pleasant thing to think about, but it is the thoughtware that's leading to the destruction of species at 200 a day and the increasing fires and the heat and the, um, on and on and on. We know, we all know about that stuff. So, so then, okay, we're faced with, on a, on a global level, the necessity of upgrading our thoughtware. And if you look at the tax form for the list of job descriptions, the kind of jobs you can have, you will not find thoughtware upgrader as one of the one of the tax form line items. They don't have they don't have a name for this. Modern culture does not have a name for your profession. So already you're an edge worker. Already you're out beyond the edges of modern culture thoughtware just to represent yourself to a potential client. You you actually need to so okay so what about joy though what about joy so what happens if you walk down the street ecstatic when you're floating and flying and, and you're radiant you're just shining what happens people think you don't have enough work to do people think you haven't read the newspaper people think they can't they can't take you seriously because what you probably you're on drugs or something you know you, you know so so, okay, so the, the thought where that modern culture is using about feelings has to do with, it says, mad, sad, and scared are bad feelings. Joy is a good feeling, but you can't feel that either. So in fact, it's not okay to feel. So if you think about it, why would we be able to feel? Why is it that we would be able to feel if this was not a crucial element to our ability to show up in and deliver what we came here to deliver on the planet? I don't think it is a design error from God. You know, the only design error from God, I think, is the size of a seed in an avocado. It's just way too big. You know, that is a design error. But the fact that we have a heart and can have feelings, this is not a design error. So then what's, the, what's wrong about the situation is our thoughtware. So it's possible to upgrade our thoughtware about feelings. And one of the pieces of thoughtware about feelings that will help us particularly with embodiment is, is um, the idea in modern culture that we have a mind and a body. You have a body with a mind. And generally the body is regarded as the thing that carries the mind around to the next meeting. So, so to, inhabit, to inhabit our full potential in possibility management, we've been doing research since 1975 and we've discovered uh, that in fact, human beings have five bodies. It isn't just a mind with a body but an, an upgraded bit of thought we're about in, in inhabiting our bodies or embodiment is we have five bodies. So we have a physical body, then we have an intellectual body. It's our mind with all of our thoughts and ideas and concepts and constructs and our, in, our, our attention. And then, and then we have an emotional body and the emotional body has a heart with both feelings and emotions, which are very different from each other. And just while we're on the topic, let me say the difference. Feelings come up, mad, sad, glad, or scared. The information and energy of the feeling is used. And then the experience of the feeling goes out of your body in less than three minutes. If you have 
anger, sadness, fear, or even joy that lasts longer than three minutes, it is not a feeling, it's an emotion. And the emotion does not have anything to do with the present moment. It has to do with the past, external authority figures, other influences, the emotions uh, are a gateway to uh, emotional healing processes. So, so you have feelings that come up, get used and go away in less than three minutes. You have emotions that come up and stick around for an hour or a day or a week, or maybe there's quite a few people these days who have a 30% intense background fear, anxiety, or, or so, so the feeling never goes back to zero. So this is an emotion, obviously it's an emotion. So it's very helpful, this distinction, but it's new thoughtware. It is not included in modern culture thoughtware. So, so far we have a physical body with all the organs of sensation and movement. And we have a, an intellectual body with a mind, with all the thoughts. We have an emotional body with a heart that has feelings and emotions, and the emotions can also be mixed. So you have anger, sadness, fear, and joy, and you can mix them like the primary colors in art and making colors. And then you end up with all kinds of emotions like depression or, or aggression or despair or melancholy or curiosity or, or so many other mixed emotion combinations. We have very many. So the fourth body is your energetic body. And your energetic body is mapped close onto your physical body. And it tells you, it tells you what's going on in space. So if you're sitting, for example, at a cafe and somebody moves their cup too close to your plate, you can feel that it's off. Okay, the way that you sense that is with your energetic body. Energetic body is sensing so much all day long. Is this too fast, too slow, too loud, too close, too, too distant? All, all these things are sensed with your energetic body. Is this appropriate timing? Is it, is it um, correct? Is it, will it serve the space? How is the space doing? This is all energetic stuff. And then you have an archetypal body. This is a fifth body. And it's a, it's a body we recently discovered only a couple of years ago, because it turns out that the, um, the archetypal body requires that you have your, your physical, intellectual, emotional, and energetic body fairly well balanced out. And then the, the archetypal body can come online. So we didn't notice it for the first years, because it took us a while to get online with our other four bodies. But the archetypal body allows a human being to interact with the archetypal part of the universe. And, and so think about it, what is the archetypal part of the universe? Well, if you think about, for example, the Godhead in the Greek mythology or Roman mythology, all the gods, or if you think about architecture that has certain geometrical proportions that, in, that cause a sacred space to arise. Or if you think of the kami, the Japanese kami spirits uh, relating that people can relate to the living part, the, the natural archetypal living part in, in all things. These are archetypal forces and including your bright principles. So you, you have this set of three, four or five bright principles that you're already serving and you can distill out which bright principles you're serving from your life. So this is the archetypal part of, of, your, this, of your body. And what's amazing about that, what gets really fascinating about that is that we can have intimacy with other human beings in each of the five bodies. So the value of embodying, not just your mind and your physical body, but also your, your emotional, energetic and archetypal body is that when you can embody all five bodies, you can 
inter, you can be intimate with another human being in each of the five bodies simultaneously. Imagine the expansion of sensation and awareness that happens as you dance with the, another human being in all five bodies at the same time with clarity and power, with uh, a spirit of adventure as an, as an investigation or as an experiment. We can interact in all five bodies. So we have these huge potential to embody not only our, our physical body and our mind, but all five bodies. And so while we're going on this journey of embodiment, um, there was just a question about shame on the, on the page. And that's, I just wanna make a note that shame is one of the, one of the mixed emotions. And if you, if you do the experiment in yourself, you will find that you can take apart shame into its component parts, just like you can take apart uh, the, the color green because it's made out of blue and yellow. It's just like that. So you can experientially dismantle the experience of shame to pull out the anger part of shame, which is you're angry because there's a rule, because there's a, an assumption that there's a way that you're supposed to be and not be. <clears throat> and the fear, <clears throat> the fear part of the shame, you can pull that out. The fear of being caught, the fear that somebody notices you're doing something that doesn't fit in, that's not right. And the sadness that, that it disconnects you from yourself and from other people and that you mix that fear and that anger and that sadness together all at the same time and you have this experience of shame. And then yeah, you yeah. Clinton, would you like, there is maybe questions, but would you say that to work with the archetypal part of ourselves or people we work with, we might need to work with the first our own bodies before we move into the archetypal body? It's a question from Pallavi, but Pallavi, she's a panelist. She wants you want to be, you can unmute yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Yes, definitely, definitely. In fact, in fact, when you're working with people, it's a, it's a big enough shock to simply introduce the emotional and energetic body to, to their world because it's a, such a, there's enough to learn. It takes a while to learn how to distinguish and navigate the energetic and emotional body. When, so I wouldn't necessarily tell your client right away, try to get them into the archetypal body. They don't have, we call it the matrix. They don't have the distinctions to comprehend what that means. So you know it, you will know about it and you will be able to, but in terms of working with a client, yeah, it's a great idea just to go with four bodies before the archetypal body. Thank you. Uh, there is another one with archetype. Would you love to somebody would love to know more about embodying the archetype of each feeling in daily life and also would love to understand how to separate mixed feelings in a way we can practice every day thank you <clears throat> the um the orientation of trying to understand is a reflection of our having been at school there is a a dominant value that's, in, that's brought into us in a kind of brainwashing that happens at school that the highest value is to know. And that we think that by understanding something or knowing it, we have, we have conquered it or we have possessed it. It turns out that that's a very weak approach to life because it leaves out the other three bodies, for example, or even four bodies. <clears throat> so if you looked at us after we graduate from, from school or college or even the university, you would see in the, uh, you would see um, a, a physical body that's kind of a little bit fit, although the elegance and the consciousness of the movements and things is a little sloppy usually. The intellectual body has this mag, mag, gigantic mass, like a giant watermelon or some huge, this is how big our intellectual body has been pumped full of information and tested and tested and stretched out. And then we look at, okay, where's the emotional body? 
Well, it's this tiny little thing that hasn't even been named in school and your energetic body even less. So this imbalance, and we come into the world <clears throat> with this imbalance and we look at each other and we all have the same handicap. We all have the same, we come out of school and we think it's normal to have this massive mind that's disconnected from the emotions and the energetic world and the archetypal world. And we go, everybody has the same disease. It must be normal, but it's not. It's a distortion from modern education. So, um, so while we're talking along, I'm sorry to say that even if I explained it entirely for you, it would, it would, it's not gonna help you. What, and what really will help you will be uh, experiential distinctions that are balanced out into all five bodies. And then you have the map, not just in your mind, but you have the map in all five bodies. And that's, that's where we're going with this. So, um, and also in terms of bright principles, was that the second part? There's, we have a website called brightprinciples.mystrikingly.com. And so it's in the list of, no, it's not, but anyway, it's, we have this um, yeah. website available for you. You'll find it easily in the list. And I encourage you to go there if you want more information about the bright principles. And good. was that those questions? Yeah, there is also how can someone map the possibilities for themselves in their clients' daily lives or long-term goals? That was the question. How can someone map their possibilities for themselves as well? The best, the best procedure that we found for this is to create a possibility team. So there's a website called Possibility Team. It has exact information because here's the thing. We can more easily solve another person's problem than our own. You get that? It's easy to solve somebody else's problem, but it's more difficult to look at the prison that we're in. It's difficult for us to see our own assumptions, our conclusions, our stories, and because we've been living inside of this construct, which in possibility management, we call the box. It has other names like ego or worldview or psychology or identity, comfort zone. It has uh, a lot of these other names. We just call it the box. So your being is living inside your box and it's very easy for other people to see your box. See, the thing that stands between us and our potential is the box. So it's made up of, like I was mentioning, assumptions, interpretations, stories, memories, conclusions, decisions. It's built out of this, um, all these internal uh, components of a structure that we live inside, which at the beginning, up until we're 18 years old, is a, a filter. It's, a, it's an interface between our being and the, and the world. So for the first 18 years of our life, we need that construct in the same way that a, a little baby chick needs uh, a shell or a butterfly needs its chrysalis to survive until it's ready to hatch out, which for a human being is about 18 years old. We're ready to meet our authentic adulthood initiatory processes. And this would bring us into a, an ability to embody our in five bodies, the procedure, and it would let us change our relationship to that box so that it doesn't imprison us, it actually serves us. It becomes a set of tools that we use to interact with other people in the world. So that, that is the thing that's blocking our possibility. And in a possibility team, you have the power to say, hello, please give me possibility about how I can build a nano nation in which I can inhabit and create and inhabit a culture that I would love to live in so that I can step out of the construct of modern culture, but I have something in, to move into rather than just nothing. It's rather than just being a bum on the street. So please give me possibility about what it would take for me to build uh, a nano nation for, for my culture to thrive in. For okay. example, go no. ahead. No, no, somebody was asking about the bright principles. 
because was uh, somebody misheard. What was the bright principles? Something. Yeah, if they start at the tape at the beginning, they'll see we talked about bright principles already. There's a and there's a website called brightprinciples.mystrikingly.com, and you can find it at spaceport.mystrikingly.com under the letter B, and it will find it for bright principles right there. And I highly recommend researching bright principles. I'm happy that you're interested in that. So I'm getting to the place where it would be time for you to experience a different use for anger, for example, as one of the four feelings to, to decide that uh, either you're going to use the old thoughtware about feelings, which is going to stop you from getting your potential, from helping other people, from creating change, from taking a stand, from showing up in the world as you're as doing the job that you came here to do. That's all stopped in a frozen status because you have thoughtware about your feelings and emotions that prevent you from getting access to the intelligence and information of your feelings. So the, there, is, there, there is new thoughtware available. There is new thoughtware available. And um, we've been uploading it. We have, we're, we're working on filling up over 380 websites at the startover.xyz form platform we have a platform called startover.xyz and that will give you entryway for free 24 hours a day seven days a week to over 380 websites that we're filling up with distinctions and experiments and uh building out a whole interconnected um book it's like a space in the world it's a training program an online free thoughtware upgrade person personal transformation, um, evolutionary game world that you can enter and play, you know, do the experiments and record your matrix points. So you can, you can actually learn all this stuff. So you can actually explore and learn it for free online, wherever you are. And we, I really hope you, you do that. I hope you jump in there and just start exploring because there's so much great stuff. So the thing is for you to, get access to your potential and for you to also get act, get your clients access to their potential, one of the key elements will be upgrading their thoughtware about anger, sadness, fear, and joy. And the new thoughtware about feelings is that there are no negative or positive feelings anymore. Feelings are neutral energy and information available to serve you professionally and in your everyday life. Then also you can access your feelings and emotions by lowering your numbness bar, because in modern culture, we have to have a numbness bar very high so that we're not overwhelmed by the intensity of advertisements and political stuff. And it's just the noise that comes out of modern culture we, but we can lower the numbness bar and get access to the low intensity feelings because your feelings can be from 0% intense all the way up to 100% intense, which are, and the archetypal level of feeling is 100% intense. I'll just let you know in the last trainings, we, we made spa a safe space for men and women to go to archetypal levels of anger. We usually do that first. And then what happens is, is when you go to the high intense levels of anger, it turns a switch on in your body that brings, somebody was mentioning an, an archetypal structure in your body to life, which of course is the warrior or warrioress, the doer, the maker. It's that archetype that gets turned on when you, we call it stellating, which means to turn into a star, your archetypal level of anger when you, for no reason. You know, if your numbness bar is high, then you can't feel anything until the impulse of the feeling gets up past your numbness bar. So you think you're numb, but you're actually 75% angry. Then you go to 85% angry and you jump, this experience jumps from I'm numb 
to 85% archetypal anger and you explode. And then you throw dishes on the wall, you kick the dog, you slam the door, you honk your horn and cuss at people and you, you went from numb to this high level of anger. And that's because you have a high numbness bar and you were not aware when the feeling was 3% big or 18% big and you didn't even feel it. And you were feel your body was telling you, eh, eh, I am feeling this. And you couldn't feel it because your numbness bar was high. So your first step is to start to lower your numbness bar. And then you start feeling anger, sadness, fear, and joy at lower intensity levels. And you can use the intelligence and energy of your four feelings, anger, sadness, fear, and joy as neutral energy and information to navigate your daily life. So this is the new thought map of feelings. So when the, on the new thought map of feelings, you still have feelings and emotions. So feelings are used for handling things, making decisions, taking action, starting things, stopping things, changing your relationship to things, negotiating things, making offers. This is what the feelings are for. The emotions, the ones that stick around longer, the ones that last a long time, those are for a, each emotion you have is a gateway to an emotional healing process, which probably if you're as a, working as a coach, you would love to be able to more clearly and effectively deliver emotional healing processes for your clients. We have a website on there just called process.mystrikingly.com. Com, and it has very clear instructions for how to do this. It's so powerful to have the new thoughtware upgrade about feelings and emotions. Just those few distinctions that we've talked about already will change people's lives. It will give them a whole new future. And, and not only that, but when you start learning to separate the emotions, somebody who suffered from Depression, for example, I had low grade depression for 30 years of my life until I encountered this work, until I learned to be angry and separately sad because depression is oftentimes just the experience of mixing anger and sadness together. When you can separate that into I'm angry about this and I'm sad about this, there is no more depression. It is so amazing. So I'm not saying every kind of depression is healed this way, but a lot is, especially common ordinary depression is healed by separating the anger from the sadness. So bringing these distinctions to your clients experientially, not just in their mind, is, is fantastic. So this is a fabulous upgrade in the services that you can provide to your clients. It's just starting to use some of these distinctions from possibility management. I just want to be clear that possibility management is really not about feelings work. But when we started delivering possibility management, we realized that until a person can move to the new thought map of feelings, they can't get present enough to create or destroy possibility. They can't, they can't unleash their potential unless they can uh, experience embodiment in five bodies with clarity and power and that and that thing is so amazing everything we do is copy left i just want you to know that everything we do is copy left everything on every website the books there's two fantastic books out there from me right now one is this directing the power of conscious feelings and another one is called building love that lasts both of these books are full of distinctions full of experience Experiments full of empowerment for embodiment in five bodies. So those two books are available. You just go on Amazon and Google Clinton Callahan and you'll get the books right up there. So all of this stuff is copy left. That means steal it. That means take all of it, all of the exercises, all of the, all of the practices, use them, write your own, deliver workshops with them, write your own books with them. This is the reason it's copy left is we figured out after some years that possibility management is thoughtware for next culture. It is, it's like, how do, how do human beings move into 
a regenerative culture. This, this cannot be done using the thought where from modern culture. Modern culture is a capitalist, patriarchal empire based on competition, scarcity, I win, you lose games, and it's killing the entire life on planet Earth. So how do we move to a culture that's regenerative, that is collaborative, that has local authority? And so one of the things we have to do is face into the fact that modern culture has full of superstitions. Modern culture is full. So what is a superstition? So when I think of the word superstition, I think of when a black cat crosses my path, if it's from the left to the right, I have this kind of luck. If it's from the right to the left, I have another kind of luck. If I, if I walk under a ladder that's leaned up against a building and I walk under the ladder, if I break a mirror, I will have bad luck. If I spill the salt, I, will, I have to throw some over my left shoulder to counteract the bad luck. Has, has anybody heard of these kind of superstitions? Yeah, okay. Well, see, we now know those things are superstitions. However, before a superstition becomes a superstition, what is it? It's reality. Before we recognize something as a superstition, we think it's real. We think it really is like that. And so what I'm saying is modern culture, once you start to understand what a superstition is and how it works, modern culture is based on superstitions such as the economy or money. Money is a superstition or uh, uh, representative government. You know, are you represented in your government? I mean, it's a superstition. It doesn't really happen. Uh, security. Security is a modern culture superstition. Security does not exist in reality. You know, in reality, we're all going to die somehow. And no matter how much insurance you have, or no, how, no matter how big your army is, it, it's, everybody's going to die. So this whole, it came from Helen Keller, the blind, deaf, mute lady, who, who said that superstition is, I mean, security is a superstition. It doesn't exist in nature. Life is a, a daring adventure or nothing. And so that was what she said about it. But the, it's a superstition to try to, make things safe and to try to you know empower the government to keep you safe from itself whatever so yeah so okay so there's these huge superstitions that are at work that people like for example even owning land it's such a superstition how is it possible or corporate personhood it's it's impossible this is that a, that a corporation can take responsibility is so far away from reality yet it's a law in the land. So this, this law, the, the rule of law of Western civilization is exterminating life on earth. Anybody who follows that law is criminally insane. And anybody who enforces the law of Western civilization has already forfeited their life because they're fighting for the extinction of life on the planet. You can walk through your world in a space of that clarity that frees you up from having to be afraid of the rules and laws that are trying to control you to not invent next culture. Buckminster Fuller said something like, and we've interpreted it a little bit. He said, you cannot change things by fighting against the existing game worlds. You can change things by building new game worlds that make the existing game worlds irrelevant. The, the new game worlds are far more fun 
They're far more exciting. And so the, the idea here is to not get left behind playing in a stupid game world. Who builds the new game worlds? It's you. How can you build your new game world? You change your relationship to anger, sadness, fear, and joy. I'm looking at the clock. The clock says we have three minutes, eight minutes. How much time do we have left? Just hold up your, Monica, how much time? Eight minutes, it's still eight okay. To with questions, eight minutes with questions. It's still All right, let's do some questions. There is still some, like uh, there were some questions, uh, somebody was asking, are the five bodies analogs to the five koshas in yoga? I don't know. I don't know as well, okay. Wait, wait just wait a second. <clears throat> When we think about embodiment, we can use the modern culture embodiment, which is you have a mind and you have a body. So you go to the physical fitness center and you eat good food and you're embodied. Okay, and then you, then you think a lot the rest of the time. So this is the training from modern culture. Or you could go to Eastern religious philosophies like yoga, meditation, these, these kinds of things. And that's another set of thoughtware about uh, how to embody yourself. So you do your yoga, you do your vegetarianism, you do your um, meditation practices. Yeah, or you can try to embody yourself by singing and dancing and movement with contact improvisational movements and dance. And you can try to embody yourself that way or tantric sex practices. You can try to embody yourself that way, okay? Or you can upgrade your thought wear. And all of a sudden, when you upgrade your thought wear, you have five bodies instead of two. Or, or sometimes in the Eastern tradition, they have a third body, the spiritual body. Okay. So, so but if you, if you start upgrading your thought wear and use five bodies, there's far more possibilities for embodiment. And there's so much clarity to support this. I just wanted to point that out. So you have different approaches for how to how to approach embodiment. This is just a, a different way, but it includes five bodies. Monica, there's another question. Yeah, when speaking about different layers of thoughts, feelings, are you also referring to different aura layers? The, the aura layers we found is mostly a reflection of the energetic body. So it's just, just an some people can resonate or see the energetic body. I think every one of us sees the energetic body in different ways. So some people interpret it as color and has certain meaning. But I don't, we don't go in that direction because it's not, it hasn't been so useful for us to try to, you know, again, then you understand something, but you can't really use it. You can't use it for as a distinctions. So let me tell you, we're not going to have time to do the experience that I wanted you to have. I was gonna give you three minutes to get a towel and start going like this and start to feel anger on the new map of feelings. And you, you would do it for three minutes and you just start yelling and screaming and shouting out your voice. Ah! And you just start doing this for three minutes. Then you come to a stop. See, it would say, please come to a stop. <clears throat> and then and then we we, come back to center. And then the next time I would say, we're going to do it for three more minutes, only this time use words and say what you are angry about. So then you go like this for three minutes and you say words like, I hate it that the fish are dying in the ocean. I hate it, there's so much plastic around. Nobody's taking care of it, I hate it. The kids have to go to school and it gets programmed with shit from the last culture that isn't working anymore, like this. You do that for three minutes. And then you write down what you said. And what we found out is, is what you're angry about is what you care about. What you're angry about that doesn't exist in the world today, the thing that you're angry about that doesn't exist in the world today is what you came here to build. It isn't about being a victim that it's not here. Oh my, you know, I don't like it that it's not here. Go to the next level. You're angry that it's not here. It's your job to build it. And that's why we're so excited about game worlds. We have plenty of information about building a game world 
We have plenty of information about building a nano nation. We have plenty of information about you, how to create and move into the culture that you would love to embody. Right now we're kind of forced to embody a modern culture that's killing life on planet earth. It doesn't have to be that way. You people here are leaders, you're edge workers. You're the ones who have the ability, the knack, the skill to build a new culture for other people to move into. And if you build it, they can move into it. And if you don't build it, nobody can move into it. So really you can, you can build a culture that you would love to embody and move into and live in. And you don't have to, you don't have to submit yourself to the culture that's killing life on planet earth. Yeah, I feel quite sad we haven't done the exercise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, with nothing stopping you now. All you need is a towel and three minutes. And yeah. Complete instructions. So the second time you do it, you write down what you say and then you show it to your friends at your possibility team and, and say, I'm angry about this and this and this. What does that mean? What am I here to build? And they will help you. You, you know, you can help each other build, uh, distinguish, distill down and find out exactly what your project is. And if you, if you, you know, you can quit your corporate job. You do not need to be a slave in a corporation. You can, you can serve people in a way doing this stuff where you have plenty of money and you don't need to submit yourself to a slavery in a corporate job. Please do this, please. You have the resources inside you. You upgrade your thoughtware, get your anger, you got your clarity, go. So yeah. yeah. There could be suggestion if people wants to try this, perhaps can go after this session to the coffee break and do it together there. But I would say maybe last question, any tips of on identifying our current software system or is just a case of doing exercises for each of the bodies? That is a question. Yeah, it's, last one. that's what it is. We have a website called rageclub.org, which is where uh, people online all over the world are offering online rage clubs. There's something like four weeks or eight weeks, one time a week. And you go in there and people change so much in those rage clubs. And then, and not only that, but you can learn to deliver rage clubs. And just by delivering rage clubs, it's like $20 for one session and you do eight sessions. And it's like, just by delivering the rage club, you, you do, can quit your corporate job. I mean, it's that is straightforward. This is so necessary to bring people back to life, to get people online with themselves, embody, themselves. This is so important and you can do this. So there's also, just to tell you, there's an amazing little website called 333. Oops, I have to do it this way. Um, give me one second. This is, this website gives you clear instructions to do this exercise with the towel at home three minutes, three times a week for three months, your whole nervous system will change. You'll get back access to the archetypal anger that has the clarity and that can make the distinctions and has the energy for building the culture you would love to live in. That is really amazing because we really, really uh, repressed our feelings so much and I really resonate with when you show the body like we have big head but our emotional body is so small I really resonate that because it's so true like we grow at school so much we have to know but not about what we feel and when we are oh, I'm really some way sad to finish mm -hmm. but uh, people can find you what is the best way Clinton. Yeah, so I mean, the most amazing thing that you could do if you really want to take a giant step is an expand the box training. It's a three to five day total thoughtware upgrade. Called expand the box is being delivered all over the United States and Europe. And, and please do that. Please do that. It is three to five days you walk out as with a different set of thoughtware. And then you, you have all that to give to other people because it's copy left. It is open code thoughtware. 
It is not copyrighted. It cannot be copyrighted. Copyrighted. So, uh, yeah, the 333 website is on there. Yes. Um, yes, so that's the biggest thing. So uh, my, my personal website, clintoncallahan.org, just leads you into other websites. So it's, I encourage you to check out the other websites. The startover.xyz is so full of great stuff. And possibilitymanagement.org is also where you get access to the trainings. So it's right there. Amazing. Thank you so much. I just want to announce for next session of this channel would be leveraging psychedelic experiences with me, Miriam Van Groen. And uh, there is also coffee chat, coffee break. If you want to go and practice this exercise you've been given, please go there. If you feel that you really benefit from this talk and you want to gain access forever, please go and upgrade. Everything is in the chat. Uh, the library will be for you always. And I just want to ask Clinton as a last tip for what is the, your top tip for staying embodied? Maybe just few, one minute, like what you feel like you would for people to take away with them. I, it's my experience that like conscious anger provides the design criteria for paradise. Conscious anger provides the design criteria for paradise and it's in you. So something completely different from this is possible right now. And please, please, please keep, keep going in, in the research. This is new stuff. It's really, it's really new stuff. And I, um, we need trainers. We need possibility management trainers in the world. And it starts out holding Rage Club, delivering possibility team, getting in the trainer path. There's a whole organ, a whole website called trainerpath.org. It's in the list. There's a lot of information how to take your next steps. We need you. So please let yourself be surprised by how much you have to say in the world. Yeah, I love that. Conscious anger provides the design criteria, criteria for paradise. I think people write down as well. It's a very great tip. I, it's very, very, very helpful and Good. inspiring. I'm really yeah. taking so much away as well. And thank yeah, you so, so much. And Pallavi and Roberta and Genevieve, like all you guys, thank you so much for being brave and coming here and into the main room so I could get somebody to talk to. So Abby, mm -hmm. thanks a lot for your help in the technical dimension. And Monica, thanks for your support. Thank you so much. See you soon. Okay. Come to coffee break. Oh, oh. Thank all right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, you guys. Bye. Bye.